Good afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. What is it about our bones and artifacts that make non-Indigenous people want to collect them like trophies? It's not just creepy or bizarre people. It's like academics and museums. They cling to these items, refusing to repatriate them. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and this is what we're putting in focus today, that phenomenon. Join in our conversation. That includes you listening on Element Radio in Toronto at 106.5 FM and in Ottawa at 95.7 FM. You can call us toll-free, 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in Focus. Later in the show, we are going to chat about uh, the Prime Minister's apology for the government's treatment of Inuit people who had tuberculosis in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Before I introduce you to our guests, though, let's take a look at a story that involves extinct people from Newfoundland and their stolen remains, which are sitting in Scotland. Skulls preserved in a museum. Evidence of a violent encounter with the last of the Red Indians. The Beothuk of Newfoundland. The arrival of European settlers to Newfoundland didn't bode well for the Beothuk. The tribe was run further and further from sea resources inland and their population dwindled. After a battle with settlers, the chief and the tribe's best hunter were killed. The chief's wife, Dumasduit, was taken to live with the head of the murderous exhibition, John Payton. Within 10 months, she will be dead. Soon after, her people will be extinct. Adding insult to injury, another settler comes along eight years later, William Cormack. He robs the grave where Dumas DeWitt has been buried among her people. In 2016, APTN Investigates went to Newfoundland to uncover the battle to have these remains repatriated. With the Beothic extinct, Mi'kmaq Chief Meisel Joe felt compelled to step in. Here's a clip from Todd Lamarin's Investigates piece, Extinction Event. A dozen years ago, Chief Joe briefly sat on the board of the still-existing Beothic Institute. During discussions, I learned that uh, the skull of this uh, lady was taken, not just one skull, but two skulls were taken by Cormac in 1827. He learned they were now in Edinburgh, Scotland, under the care of the Scottish National Museum. Chief Joe asked if they could be brought back. And, uh, I got a cool reception and uh, from that and um, so I stayed in the back of my mind for a long time and uh, keep talking about it and wondering about it and I helped him to make drums finally two years ago he traveled to the museum to see the skulls he had them laid out in a small room uh, maybe half the size of his office and a table and they had a white cloth put down and they had uh, the skulls put onto the white cloth he performed a sweet grass ceremony over the skulls, more to calm his nerves than anything else, he says. And it's a, kind of an emotional moment. I'm 68 years old, and I've heard those stories all my life about the Beatty people and what happened to them, about the uh, grave robbing that took place. And, and all of a sudden to be in the same room with those remains and uh, have that history flash in front of your eyes, you know, it's... While in Scotland, he asked how to get the remains back. That we need uh, the process of having the federal government uh, make their request to have the remains turn, return to Canada and it had go to a national museum. A national museum like the Canadian Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg or the one in Halifax or four in the Ottawa area. I think those remains should come directly to Newfoundland. And once they're in Newfoundland, then I think uh, between all of us, us and government, we, we should decide what we want to do. Their spirit will be other people not at rest. You've got parts of their bodies scattered all over the world. And to me, that's, uh, that's sickening and it's disgustful and it's disrespectful. Joining us now is Rai Moran, the director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Returning remains and artifacts is a key step towards reconciliation. Uh, but is it happening? Is it happening fast enough? And what more can be done? Hey, Rai. 
Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I can hear you, that's good. Uh, so the Wonderful. bones and the cultural belongings of our ancestors, I mean, they're scattered all around the world. What is your theory, just to kick this all off, uh, as to why these are collectible things to non-Indigenous people? Well, I think there's a couple things that are going on with this diaspora or this destruction or this collection, if you will. Uh, one, there was and remains a, a long-standing perception by Western colonial powers that they're, they were culturally superior, spiritually superior. Um, indigenous peoples were, for part of this history at least, seen as novelties and were brought back to uh, Europe as exhibitions. Uh, peoples themselves, not just bones, but peoples. We have to remember that it wasn't that long ago in this world that we actually had things like human zoos where indigenous peoples from all over the world were collected, put in cages essentially, and then displayed for the benefit of Western audiences. So that's one aspect of, of this um, history. The other relates to the very problematic origin stories that we've maintained in this country for a very long period of time, this idea that it was empty, empty land or terra nullius, mm -hmm. and that people could just come in and, and collect whatever they saw fit. Now, that emptying of the land, you know, has more accurately been called a, a clearing of the land, uh, and that was, of course, wrought by disease, uh, by forced removal, forced relocations, um, destruction of culture, uh, removal of children into residential schools, that then sort of perpetuated that myth that indigenous peoples weren't present in certain areas and, and kind of legitimated or allowed these collectors to come in and kind of feel like they had a right, which of course they never have had a right to disturb sacred or ceremonial sites. So do you think that we're at a point now that people are starting to understand, like they get it, that uh, they should be returning these things? Things are evolving for certain in the world and uh, you know, I, we come back to that idea of the human zoo, right? I mean that was so contemporary, gross. normal, political thought, uh, social thought of a particular era. <laughs> Thankfully, we are not in that time anymore, and we continue to evolve as a society through frameworks like, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and international human rights frameworks. Um, this country is becoming more and more aware of its responsibilities to Indigenous peoples. Uh, this conversation is not going away. It's happening worldwide, and I think the world is awakening to the fact that this is a live issue. Uh, we still have a ways to go, though, to really figure out exactly what this means. So, I mean, here in Winnipeg, uh, when the Canadian Museum for Human Rights was being built, uh, the construction workers had unearthed more than 400,000 artifacts dating uh, as far back as uh, 1100 AD. So it proved uh, that the area where the Assiniboine and the Red Rivers meet, known as the Forks here, that it was in fact a trading hub for First Peoples, but even longer uh, than many initially thought. So that was in 2008, 2012 was the kind of the t chunk of time that, it, that they took to say, oh, we've realized that there's, there's stuff here, let's excavate it uh, carefully. And it, it was a, a pretty big process, I guess, in that four year span. So how do you think that, how do you feel that the museum handled that? The discovery of these things, the extraction of these things, and then where, what have they done with these things? Yeah. So first of all, there's no surprise that artifacts were found there. And there's no surprise that artifacts are found everywhere in Canada because Indigenous peoples have been in this land for a really long period of time, <laughs> right? So we have to stop being surprised by that. And the reality is too, is, is that where it's a good place to live has always been a good place to live. You know, yeah. via at, at uh, river mouths, at you know, river, uh, critical junctures uh, between major watersheds. I mean, these are places that people live. And these are typically places that cities now have been built upon. So we have to recognize that cities have paved over much of this original inhabited land and everywhere is indigenous land. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that I think happened with the, the creation of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is twofold. And it speaks to the overall protection regime and archaeological regime that operates in this country. Mm -hmm. So there was a kind of a general site survey and then there was an in-depth site survey that was done, to my understanding, uh, on the site. Now, the general site survey is, is much more um, invasive and a lot less thorough. And essentially what that entails is as the bulldozer goes along, archaeologists are there generally documenting what they're seeing. And that isn't the same as a comprehensive kind of quadrat um, based uh, archaeological examination of a site. And I think what that 
tells us is that this country generally does get away with um, uh, perhaps desecrating or penetrating indigenous sites of occupation and is sometimes allowed to get away with a, a very minimal um, documentation and, and maybe affirmation just that yeah there's stuff here and we're not really going to do all that much about it right yeah that's a good point yeah. um, so yeah. and then I guess how when, when you find these things I mean how do you um, how do you even go about like I mean, everybody's kind of upset that you have possession of our stuff or you have remains of our stuff but how do you when you find stuff like this how do you how would you even know who to give it to Mm. Right. Well, this is a, this is a significant issue for the country right now, and um, some of the listeners may be aware of the fact that there's a debate happening uh, within Parks Canada right mm -hmm. now about their uh, facility that they have in Winnipeg that has a lot of archaeological ar artifacts in it. Yeah. So, on the one hand, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, museums and archives um, have protected a lot of information that we as Indigenous peoples. Um, are thankful for in many ways. Uh, there is um, a preservation of history that has been very, very important and very, very fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look simply at archives, and this is an area that I'm really most familiar with, mm -hmm. you know, we turn to archives all the time to prove how Canada eroded or eliminated our rights on a systematic basis. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the best way to win a legal argument is to use the government's own words against it. And those archives provide a very important record for that, that we continue to turn to to understand that long-standing abrogation. I think where we're at now is, is that we have to recognize that uh, in accordance with the UN Declaration, in accordance with just good relationship, um, we have to re-understand those relationships and solid unilateral ownership by the state is not on anymore mm -hmm. and we have to move into at the very least a process of co-ownership and more fully uh, a process of return to communities now sitting right beside that though is this other significant structural problem that we have in this country that we've built systems that are uh, built in the image of western systems and we haven't invested in that same system on the indigenous side of the house. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen the same type of museums being created specifically for indigenous peoples that are fully under indigenous control and ownership. And that remains a, sub a substantial issue for this country. And we either have to reform the institutions uh, that we have now to the point that indigenous peoples are fully included in all of the decision making around ceremonial objects or we have to build an alternate system and the reality is we probably need to do both in many cases and this hasn't even been I, or I might be missing it but I don't even think that I've heard this as a topic of discussion anywhere that you know let's let's set uh, communities up so the stuff that has been taken from them robbed from them can be returned to them and they will have the ability to care for it unless I'm missing something is there that conversation going on have you heard yeah, there are some really good examples of uh, repatriation efforts that have happened. Uh, so on Haida Gwaii and on the west coast of the country, um, uh, the Mitsa Cultural Center in, in Kwagil territory has done outstanding work in bringing items back and bringing those back under uh, traditional uh, protocol as well. Um, those are but some of the examples that are in the country. Again, we can even turn to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is, of course, where I work, mm -hmm. and we can recognize that we've just... In a, in a way repatriated a huge volume of documents, photographs uh, from yeah. church and government archives under an Indigenous-led institution. So it is shifting, it is changing. Um, we're not really seeing big national um, scale uh, efforts as of yet, but you know things are starting to reform. And I, and I know that this is a very active and live uh, question within museums and archive circles for sure. Well, I'm happy to hear that it's being discussed there. And, it, and you guys do deserve props, too. That is, it's, uh, all of this history has been uh, compiled and returned to Indigenous powers at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So that is pretty amazing when you think of that. That's a, that's a lot of records. Okay. Oh, it's a big deal. And yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rai. We always appreciate it when you take time to share your thoughts with us. We have got to take a quick break, but when we come back, our listeners on Element Radio in Toronto and Ottawa th stay with us. And of course, to our viewers, stick around too. We will be back with more on this uh, fascination with our bones and our stuff. 
join our conversation now, you can call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786, like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page, follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus, and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now to hear some of what you are saying about today's topic. We asked the question, should Indigenous artifacts be returned to their communities uh, from public displays and not be part of private collections? Uh, yes, the majority of... Oh, this is sorry, this is from B. She says, yes, the majority were likely taken without permission in the first place. Good point. Kevin says, yes, because the thieves don't rightfully own them. Their people do. Uh, and even more so, if those artifacts are grave goods, they should be returned to the earth where or near they were uncovered. <laughs> Tanya says, yes, uh, or no, Ta I don't know what Tanya, she says the explanation should be, an explanation should be needed as to why. If I bury something, it's not because I want it dug up in the future. If I did, I'd leave a sign saying so. And Patricia says artifacts found or taken from protected areas should be returned to proper authorities. What I have found on my property stays here, though. And Mosum says many First Nations are not equipped to handle these antiquities nor prepared to take on the responsibilities. That's something that uh, Ryan Moran had just uh, had pointed out as well. And Mark says yes, they should be, if they were taken from, uh, from them or even given to them, and the person that it was given to past and who cares if they can care for them or handle them, uh, give them back. If you would like to add your opinion to the topic of conversation, here's how you can do so. Now, you can call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786, like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page, follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus, and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. So today we are discussing repatriating Indigenous artifacts and remains. It was inter international news last week, Don Miller was a 91-year-old Indiana man who had spent his entire life traveling the globe, uh, collecting artifacts and antiquities, including many that were illegal to possess, kind of an amateur Indiana Jones. He died in 2015, and as authorities were, co as authorities were combing through his farmhouse, which had been turned into a veritable museum, they found crazy amount of uh, items, including some 2,000 bones that belonged to approximately 500 humans. The FBI believes that those were dug up from indigenous burial grounds and, that, and they're trying to get those bones back to the tribes from whom they were stolen. Last week, I spoke to uh, FBI Special Agent Tim Carpenter in Washington, D.C., and he heads up the investigation. Let's take a look at that conversation. So how and when did the FBI become involved uh, in this collection of D this Don Miller in Indiana? Uh, the FBI first received a tip on this case in late 2013. And so did he, he was still alive at that point, is that correct? He was, yep. And was he, when you guys approached him, was there any uh, indication from him that he was interested in, in repatriating these remains uh, with, with to the rightful resting place? Yeah, I think so. I mean, from our earliest conversations with Don, uh, he kind of understood the gravity of the situation. He was very cooperative uh, throughout the course of the investigation, as I stated publicly. We had a very cooperative uh, relationship with him, and, you know, it's my belief, my fundamental belief, that he, at the end, he wanted to see uh, not only all the ancestral remains that were re recovered, but all of the objects and the various artifacts from different cultural groups that he had. Uh, he wanted to see those objects returned home. And why would somebody want to collect things? I mean, he, he had a lot of other things. He had, uh, you know, artifacts from Ming Dynasty and whatnot. I can see some of the art and, and that sort of thing. But to be digging up human remains, why do people? Why are people interested in that? Well, the truth is, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, Don was passionate about his collection and the type of activities uh, that he was doing and that he engaged in. And I think uh, 
in this instance, you know, in this case, his passions kind of ran away with him a little bit. Um, you know, we all know that uh, collecting certain types of materials, whether it's cultural property or if it's just collectibles or whatnot, uh, clearly there are legal means to do that kind of activity. And then, you know, in certain cases, they, they tend to cross the line. And I think in this case, you know, Don, his passions got ahead of him and he kind of crossed the line in, in certain aspects. Well, I mean, I guess if people can get excited about collecting stamps, you could get collected, uh, excited about collecting bones. So what are the tribes that, that the FBI is working with now? Uh, how did you identify which communities to get in touch with in terms of uh, returning the bones? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's an ongoing process. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would guess I'd start with saying that uh, we're still trying to communicate with all of the tribes that we need to. And I think, uh, you know, uh, if the number, if my number's right now, I think we're up to, what, 573 federally recognized tribes, uh, and then quite many more uh, non-recognized or state-recognized tribes. So when the case first developed, you know, I think once I kind of got my head wrapped around the scope and the size of the collection, it was very clear from the outset that, look, we're going to need a lot of help. Yeah. Uh, this is not something that we have organic expertise in to the, to the links that we would need that expertise to identify all of these disparate pieces from all of the different corners of the country. And then, you know, then you include the international stuff in as well from every corner of the globe. So I think one thing that we did early that was maybe unprecedented, you know, particularly for the FBI, is that we engaged with the tribes from minute one. Now, a problem with that is, of course, I don't necessarily know who to contact and who to talk to at each tribe. So we started uh, the, the old-fashioned way, if you will. We just started by sending out letters. Uh, so we, we sent hard letters to every federally recognized tribe in the United States. Uh, we followed with emails. And then just quite a bit of word of mouth. Uh, we just asked folks to get the word out, and we started having uh, teleconference, national teleconference calls with the tribe just to kind of brief them. Here's the case that's under development, and that we are seeking help from the tribes to come in and not only help us identify the pieces, but maybe even more importantly, tell us what we shouldn't be doing. You know, we were very cognizant that there were going to be cultural considerations that maybe we were ignorant of or that we hadn't fully considered, like treatment of ancestral remains. How do we do this with dignity? And, you know, how do we collect the material, hold the material? How do we package it properly? And so we really wanted that advice um, and, you know, expertise from the tribal communities at the earliest outsets of the case. Uh, and then as we were going, uh, even while we were on site, we had uh, some tribal representatives at the search site with us to advise us on the ground. Uh, you know, certainly we can't have tribal representatives from every nation there. We just can't do that. But we had uh, some representation there. Uh, and then we were continuing to hold those national conference calls, even while we had boots on the ground out at Mr. Miller's property collecting material. This is incredible. Just my last question for you. Are any of these uh, artifacts, these bones, have they been individually marked as to where they may have come from or when? Uh, yeah, I won't go into great detail about that. Uh, we did have some indication uh, on the remains, and, you know, we've taken those lines of evidence and followed those logically as we could. Uh, but I will say that in most instances, uh, unfortunately, we did not have that level of information. Mm. Well, best of luck as you guys get these back to the rightful resting places. And thanks again for taking time to join us today. All right. Thank you. So I'm joined in studio now by Martha Troy, and she is a journalist here at APTN. She's covered a lot of these types of stories. Before we get chatting with her, though, we're going to go. We've got a couple callers, so let's hear from them. Pam from Alberta, are you there? Pam? All right. Thank you. Hello? Hey, how are you? Fine, fine. Good. So I understand that you've got uh, something that is being returned to your community, t like tomorrow. Can you Sorry? tell us? You've got something in your possession, or you will be get receiving something that tomorrow that is uh, something that had been taken or is remains. You're getting an artifact back? Okay, so we don't have Pam anymore. Let's go to Ray from Cross Lake. Ray, are you there? Ray, are you there?
Okay, we're just gonna talk to Martha here. Uh, we, this is, I think, the third week in a row we've had problems with taking phone calls. Um, okay, so you broke a story in 2017 about the number of universities here in Canada in possession of th like thousands of remains, mm -hmm. uh, quote, ranging from small bones to complete skeletons, and some from as far back as the ninth century. Uh, so we, I mean, we all assume that universities are full of super smart and super progressive people. Uh, so you would expect these would be the first people who would do kind of the right thing and say, oh, we've got these, we really shouldn't have them, let's get them back. You right. did a, a, a whole lot of research into this and you found that that's not necessarily the case. Explain right. to us who, what you found. Yeah, so back in 2017, I surveyed 12 universities across Canada. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was that, um, yeah, they are housing full skeletons to um, bone fragments of Indigenous human remains. University of Toronto, um, they had the highest number of Indigenous remains sitting at 550. Uh, and then next was Memorial University. They had the second highest number of remains. Um, they had approximately close to 200. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I learned was that while I was gathering this information, um, not all universities wanted to, I guess, give the, their information to me. I was going to so, ask that too. Like, you yeah. know, were, were people look very forth? Oh, hey, thanks for asking. Here's what yeah. we have. Or did you find right. some people going, why do you want to know? None of your business. Yeah, I did sense some resistance. I have to say that with uh, University of Victoria and uh, UBC, both mm -hmm. in British Columbia, they did not want to give me the exact number of human remains that they had in their institution. And mm -hmm. McMaster University, based in Hamilton, they um, basically did not even answer my questions, even <laughs> though I was being quite persistent with them. Oh, I know you. Yeah. You're persistent. So they didn't, yeah. So we still don't know what they have there at McMaster. <clears throat> so I guess we would say that, you know, there are some universities that it seem to get it and are, and are making positive steps and there's some that just are not playing nice in the sandbox with our bones. <laughs> yeah, like there's some institutions that have uh, repatri repatriation policies and then there's some universities that don't have any at all. So for instance, Lakehead mm -hmm. University, UVic, they don't have any policies in place. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is there's something else that I noted um, which was, oh right, the cost. So, yes. um, yeah, so yeah. If these institutions want to give back indigenous human remains to communities, um, this is in the case of UBC anyways, is that um, the cost is going to fall on the communities. You've so got to come and get the you stuff have we to stole come, from you. Yeah, fly from northern BC, wherever you're located, yeah. come and collect your ancestors, you know, um, and purchase the coffins or whatever it is that you need to put them in. Um, well, anyways, that cost is falling on the communities, not on insane. the institution. Yeah. If you want your stolen stuff back, you got to pay and come get it. Uh, Ryan Moran from Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, before the break, he was saying too, and then once these, once these communities have these remains, uh, you know, it's one thing if you, I guess, go and rebury uh, the remains of people, but if it's artifacts, it's something of cu cultural significance, mm -hmm. and it's old, you don't have, First Nations don't have the ability to care for that stuff. That's right. Never mind pack it and travel with it, you know what I mean? And, yeah. And yeah. so, but he did say that those conversations are starting to happen with many museums or universities and stuff. Yeah, um, that's right. So, we had seen a story about uh, the Beothic skulls. You, I think, broke that story that they were coming back. They are coming back to Canada uh, sometime this year. Uh, it's been a long process for that to happen. Uh, it took basically five nations, five Indigenous nations, plus. Uh, the federal government and the Canadian Museum of History mm -hmm. to basically make a formal request with, um, it's called the National Museum Scotland, yeah. to ask for those two skulls. The skulls belong to a husband and wife, uh, Nono, Nono uh, Sabasut and Demastuit. Yeah. Um, so they are coming back, and um, but the museum will keep um, burial objects that came with the remains. And the reason why is because um, what National Museum Scotland told us anyways is that uh, it's because it does. It's basically falls outside the, their policy of um, letting go human remains. I love how they get to have policies so, <laughs> for things like this. You know, museums or, or countries or whatever they get to have policy. Our policy is, and there's not much thought to. Well, what would the policy be if these people, if you hadn't made them extinct for one, mm -hmm. would they have a, a different policy, and would it be honored? I mean, I, and then there's the other thing. So when they come back here, where do they go? So they're going to go to Canadian Museum of History first, yeah. and um, from there they're going to go to uh, a museum in St. John's called The Rooms. Mm -hmm. Now what happens after that, they don't know yet, 
but um, the Premier's Office of Newfoundland had told me that they're going to ensure that Indigenous people are part of this uh, process and, mm -hmm. and uh, whether or not these remains are going to be buried. Well, and there's no, I mean, you can't go to the Beothic and say, <laughs> what would you like us to do with these? They're extinct now because of contact, right? So I, in, in the story that we'd seen, it was a Mi'kmaq chief who was kind of spearheading all of this. Mm -hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. if there's going to be part of the discussion that is, you know, there's spiritual significance to burying people. These people mm -hmm. were buried. They were grave robbed uh, by a Scottish adventurer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there going to be, do you put them back where they came from? Yeah, I think it's going to be up to, hopefully it's going to be up to the Indigenous nations uh, in the East Coast. Um, I mm. think that, you know, maybe perhaps they should have the say in, to, into what happens with these remains versus the Canadian government or the Premier's office in Newfoundland. So mm. we'll see. Yeah. Okay, I want to go to a caller, but um, I have still have a question for you about the FBI piece because you've got okay. new information on that breaking that the, today it'll be out. But let's go to we've got a few callers here. Um, Pam from Alberta, are you there? Yeah. I'm Pam, here. how are you? Okay, so you uh, are sorry. getting an artifact shipped back to you. We'll have to be quick here because we're running out of time in this block. But tell us a little bit about what's being shipped to you and how that all came to be. Um, I. I was going to talk about our experience, not about what is being shipped. You know, there's um, we've been working with museums, we've been working with bureaucrats, with organizations for a lot of years, since my participation, since 1992. Mm. And it's been ongoing. And, you know, just realizing the, the ignorance, even after um, this long of the museum staff or the bureaucrats or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the ownership that they feel that they have with our um, sacred stuff. And there's there's a fine line between what is sacred and what is traditional right. stuff. Um, and I think, you know, there needs to be more people at the table from the museums association so that there's better understanding and there's uh not this um uh it there's a whole lot of uh grief that comes along with <laughs> you know mm -hmm. working with people that are ignorant yeah and and i'm sad to say that you know it's been a very very slow process and but you but you've got results like you are getting something that yes, is what yes, sorry what but, community are you from I am from Standoff, okay. and I was born and raised at Muskwachis. And even at Muskwachis, my grandfather's stuff was taken and brought to Edmonton. And it took my family like three years to get it back. And the, the ridiculous documentation that, that uh, we had to go through to prove who we are. Mm -hmm incredible okay well good luck thanks for calling in Pat um, I just wanted to come back to Martha here for a quick second then we'll mm -hmm. go to another um, caller so you Martha had um, we watched that interview with Tim Carpenter yeah. you've d done a lot of work on the story since that interview and have some new developments can you share them with us sure so yeah <laughs> we're publishing a story today okay. online so uh, people can go check that out I APTN did .ca, APTN news .ca. Dot ca that's right yeah so I talked with a compliance officer. His name is Pete Kofi. I hope I'm not butchering his name, but he's with the Tribal Historic Pre um, Preservation Office in North Dakota. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so basically what he told me was that um, this Miller guy, he's a Christian missionary, now deceased, but um, I guess uh, what he was doing with these remains uh, that he dug up uh, was that he um, basically took them in his house and he um, he assembled them and then he dressed them in grave goods. So he had like what in fresh hell is that? <coughs> so he had like I mean bone that took chokers. creepy to a whole new level. I didn't know yeah, there was that bone element. Bone chokers to it. on the skeletons, breastplates, uh, armbands, and uh, he also what uh, Pete told me was that he also took a skull and he uh, took the crown off the skull and he placed it on his living room table and used it as a fruit bowl and he he literally put oh, fruit in, in it in a skull um, in, in a skull. one of these skulls that in came a skull. from a robbed burial site yeah cute yeah 
So um, we have a little bit more information about that since you've interviewed Tim Carpenter. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so far today, like there's been about 10 to 12 remains um, that went back to an indigenous community. Oh, okay, today. good. So it's yeah. working. That's it's, good to hear. Yeah, okay, so do we have another caller on? I think we had a Ray from Cross Lake. Margaret from Nunavut. Are you there, Margaret? Hello. Hey, Margaret, how are you? I'm okay. Good. What, uh, I'm thankful that you called in today to join our discussion. What did you want to say or what question did you have to ask? Oh, uh, I had a comment. Um, I heard someone say that they won't know how to look after stuff. I'm very insulted by that mm. as an Indigenous person. Inuit, First Nations, Métis, we have survived here for many generations. Mm -hmm. And we, the Inuit, we have looked after Northern Canada for many generations since Canada, even before Canada became mm -hmm. a country. Yeah. And also to pay for the, to get our stuff back, that's very insulting. No doubt. It's our, the, they should just, we know how to govern ourselves. And even now, we can work in more than our own mother tongue. Yeah. We use their language. And the university educated the, I always have to tell them very simple things. So just because someone's university educated doesn't mean that they no know how to do everything. Well, that's what that's what we just discussed, right? I always have to right? help those people. Yeah. Well, thank so you so much for calling in. We got to go to a quick not break have here. To okay. Bye. Thanks for calling, Margaret. Okay, when we come back, we are going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to go from bones and, and uh, artifacts to tuberculosis and the apology made last week for Canada's treatment of Inuit who had that disease. Stay with us. Welcome back. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Iqaluit uh, last week to apologize for how the federal government treated Inuit tuberculosis patients in the 40s, 50s and 60s. If you're unaware of that history, in a nutshell, the government kept people living in hellish conditions where they would get sick with TB and would pass it on very easily because they're living in overcrowded hellish conditions. So then these people are whisked from their families to sanatoriums in the south for treatment where they're stripped of their identity. They're just identified as patient number X, Y, or number five or 200 or whatever. So many of these people died. They were dumped in graves. Uh, their families weren't notified of where they were buried, that they'd even died. So uh, this is something that people uh, in, in the north are continuing to, to deal with. They're grieving missing loved ones. Anyways, Kent Driscoll, our APTN uh, Nunavut reporter, he was at the apology. Let's take a look. Between 1940 and 1960, half of the Inuit living on Baffin Island were sent to sanatoriums in the south for tuberculosis treatment. They were given numbers instead of names. They lost language and culture, and many never returned home. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau apologized to Inuit for that dark period of Canadian colonialism. It shouldn't have taken us so many years to tell you that. We are sorry that you have carried this burden for too long. We are sorry that because we waited, there are many loved ones who will never hear this apology. Today, we take responsibility for the harm caused by the policies and actions of the federal government. The racism and discrimination that Inuit faced was and always will be unacceptable. 
An apology without action is just words. The federal government and the Inuit organizations have a plan to help Inuit locate the graves of family lost during the TB epidemic. In Inuktitut, Nanilavut means let's find them. And that's what this project is about. About finding and honoring Inuit who went missing during the TB epidemic and bringing healing and closure to everyone who was left behind. Elisipi Davidi Aningmiuk lit the kulik today. She also had one of the most inspirational moments of the apology. She began singing an Inuktitut hymn and the crowd joined in. I feel good that the Prime Minister felt it was important to come back up here even when it was a day delayed. It was important to us and it was important to hear it directly from him. And so today I feel relieved. Following the ceremony, Trudeau took questions from reporters. Following those questions, ITK President Natan Obed took to the podium to scold reporters for their coverage. But the fact that media pass right, uh, right by the, the people whose human rights abuses uh, were not told by the media for decades to other stories of the day is still a reflection on the work that needs to happen on reconciliation. The government said sorry from the highest level directly to Inuit in an Inuit community. To the people in this room, that head bowed. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. I had the chance to speak with a next singer songwriter Kelly Fraser after that apology. She's originally from Santa Kilowak uh, and she now lives in Winnipeg here. She uses her voice uh, and her music to advocate for Inuit rights and, uh, and like most people in the north she had a loved one who had vanished after being taken away with TV. Here is uh, the interview that I did with Kelly. Thanks for joining us Kelly. So what did you make of the Prime Minister's apology? I'm very happy to hear that um, the federal government will be looking for the missing Inuit in unmarked graves. I am also sad to say um, it's a little too late for my family who have already lost my aunt to a policewoman's mother. Um, when, uh, they, when my mother and her sisters were taken away to Musini for TB treatment, um, w one of their sisters didn't come back and they thought she had passed, but she was um, adopted out unknowingly by, uh, by our family. Um, so there's, I mean, for people at home who maybe don't know the full impact that uh, tuberculosis has had and the fallout of it, can you just explain to viewers, like, what's, what's a typical uh, outcome or impact, I guess? Um, you had already mentioned your families, but what are some of the other horror stories that you've heard that are related to this that maybe people aren't aware of? Um, when my mother was in the sanatorium, she was only a toddler, and they would tie her up as if she's in an insane asylum. Mm -hmm and they would not change her. They mistreated her while she was there. They did not treat her like a human being. Mm -hmm. And although I understand a lot of us Inuit survived because of those sanitaria sanatoriums, a lot of us have scars because of the mistreatment of Inuit when they were there. Did you, did you have, what did you make of the Prime Minister's words uh, specifically? Did you feel that they were heartfelt? Were you impacted in any way by what he'd said or how he'd said it? I believe the Prime Minister has only, uh, he only has good intentions, but with the apology, I only hope that he, along with his government, will make sure that we, uh, we avoid dying from TB by getting proper housing so mm -hmm. 10 people aren't sleeping in a two-bedroom apartment. I hope that with this apology, they give affordable food and give transparency to the stores mm -hmm. to make sure we can eat properly if we're sick with TB and survive it. Mm -hmm. I hope 
as well of this, uh, with this apology, they will also give us proper education and more funding so that we ourselves can, we Inuit can become doctors and nurses and mental health workers to deal with the fact that a lot of us are grieving over some people that had passed and never came back home and also to grieve over uh, the people who are passing away right now from TB. We need mental health workers to help us cope with the grief and we need proper health care to make sure this does not keep happening. Right now mm -hmm. uh, we are suffering from TB still to this day because no one is doing anything about the fact that a lot of our issues comes from the fact that the federal government is not giving us enough resources to be able to, to avoid dying from TB. What are your thoughts on the launch of a database to help Inuit find relatives' grave sites? Like I said earlier, I'm very happy to hear this, but for my family, we have already lost some, some people, and um, she isn't in a grave. She's in a, she's in a community called Bridgewater in Nova Scotia in an a, in a older mental health facility. Mm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts on today's apology with us. Thanks. Thank you. Joining me now is our Nunavut reporter, Kent Driscoll. Hey, Kent. This certainly isn't your first rodeo on APTN, but is it the first time that you've been on Element FM radio in Toronto and Ottawa? Well, it's, uh, it's nice to get around, Melissa. Uh -huh. If you had have told me I was going to be on after Kelly Frazier, though, I would have been nervous. <laughs> so I just want to ask you, the, uh, it's been not quite a week since the, Premier was at, or the Prime Minister was up there apologizing. What, uh, and as we've seen, there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. Um, has the apology done anything to, for people? Uh, the apology in the moment was definitely useful to the people that were there. I mean, that uh, uh, the prime minister, he's, he's a performer. Mm -hmm. And it was a performative apology. He was trying to get his emotions across to the crowd and make people feel better. Mm -hmm. And from the people I talked to there, absolutely, yes, the people who were in the room did get something from the apology. Now, of course, out of their mouths the same second that they say they got something from it, they're also pointing out, but nothing, nothing's going to change unless there is a real push to tackle the overlying social problems here in Nunavut that allow for TB to thrive, like housing, mm -hmm. like you mentioned in your introduction. Yeah. Um, so, and it sounds to me like pretty much everybody in the North uh, has a TB story. Is that the case? Like everybody there has a family member who's been affected? Well, you got to look at it this way. In between 1940 and 1960, half, a full half of Inuit on Baffin Island were shipped south. I mean, that's a massive amount. And somewhere between 700 and 800 of those are people who just never made it home, like Kelly was describing with her aunt. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've had, uh, my own family, we've had, uh, we had a case of active TB in my family six, seven years ago. My partner ended up uh, two weeks in the quarantine here at Kikitani General and uh, my children had to be tested. We all came up clear, but, and she was treated. But like, it's, it's not like this is an ancient issue. This happens mm -hmm. every day here in Iqaluit. Yeah, well, and I mean, I guess at least you can be, you're, you can stay in your community and be treated for it, and you still get to keep your name, and you haven't been uh, just given a number, and if you happen to die from it, you're kind of pitched out with the trash, like had been the case. Previously. Oh, there's no, there's no historical comparison, yeah. but if you start looking at the amounts of TB in communities, it is still very prevalent. The, uh, mm -hmm. I have a number here. The rate, uh, the rate of TB among Inuit is 290 times higher than the rest of the country. 290 I mean, that, times That's a massive higher. public health crisis. That's crazy. 290. Oh, okay, well, Kent, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll just keep covering the TV stories because I know there's more to come. Uh, that's all the time that we have today. Thanks to all of our viewers for joining us, and I'm going to leave you with some, and of course our listeners on Element FM Radio, we're going to leave you with some more song from the Prime Minister's apology. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see you back here next week.